So good evening, everyone. And good evening to Mario Pfeiffer, who is uh, connecting from uh, Berlin. I'm Emanuela Mazzoni, so I've assisted Francesco Bonami in curating the Me Family project and uh, platform. Before starting, I want to first of all thank you, Mario, for being with us uh, today and for having accepted to be part of this uh, online public program that has been launched by the MUDAM in uh, October 2020. And today it's our sixth uh, conversation. So before we start the um, Q and A uh, talk, I will make a brief introduction about you, Mario, and then we can start with our questions and answer. So Mario Pfeiffer is a German artist who lives between New York and Berlin. He belongs to that category of artist researchers who focus their analysis on social political events the repercussions that these facts have had on society and on individuals, and also the relationship that uh, is established between the art world and the social sphere. His research is based above all on the ethnographic investigation of the place in which he decides to carry out his work. For you, Mario, the inquiry into the surrounding environment becomes fundamental to the quality of the final result. You seek to document the reality of the facts without giving your individual judgment. You let the viewer formulate um, his or her own interpretation based on personal knowledge. And uh, I'm thinking now about the two channel uh, video, uh, hashtag Blacktivist from 2015, where you collaborated over a period of six months with the New York-based hip-hop uh, trio, the Flatbush Zombies. And uh, the piece that has been a premier at the Gated Institute in New York uh, was on view at Art Cologne and shown at Berlin's Akut, but overall had, if I'm not wrong, 2.5 million YouTube views. It went uh, viral immediately, just in one day. Uh, I would say that is the most widely viewed piece of video in, um, in art history. In this uh, work, you are analyzing many different topics such as identity, and I'm referring especially to the Black Lives Matter movement, the police brutality, the right of self-defense, the right of free speech, the weapon distribution in US with reference to the second amendment, and uh, actually you shot the second part of the video in a 3D gun manufacturing workshop in Texas uh, based on the fans distributed, an online open source hardware organization that develops digital schematics of firearms in CAD files that can be actually downloaded from internet and used in 3D printing. So practically you're able to print out your own head gun with freely available files from the wiki weapon project in the video you're also presenting uh, barack obama as an hostage knees in front of the camera and in that moment the rappers are presented as terrorists who ultimately turn their weapons against themselves to be reborn in a new life merging uh, on the Brooklyn Bridge as a peaceful marching for a new change. Now I would like to ask you, Mario, if you can tell us more about the project and what was the aim you wanted to reach out, and also if you could ever imagine that this video would have gone viral in such a short amount of time. Yeah, thank you very much. Good evening to you, Emanuela, and to our viewers. So uh, Blacktivist was actually born out of, um, yeah, the birth of the Black Lives Matter movement, the death of Eric Garner, who actually coined the term, I can't breathe. So when I was invited to stage a solo show at Ludlow 38 in New York, I wanted to, as usually, somehow confront myself and my audience through my artistic practice to an everyday situation, a situation that is current, that is somehow urgent. And um, obviously the Black Lives Matter movement and the death of Eric Garner was such a, a moment in our young history. And uh, it was clear to me that I needed to collaborate with not only people that are part of the movement and somehow experience everyday police brutality, but also maybe have 
a cultural technique that that would allow us to reach a wider audience. And I was always interested in hip hop, uh, social political music, music with a message. Uh, the birthplace of hip hop was New York. So um, I followed somehow my my wish to engage in a music video production as an art piece uh, with rappers of a younger generation that were sensitive to the topic, were able to reflect on the topic out of their own experience, and also to speak to a really wide audience via YouTube, for example. So the Flatbush Zombies had already then a huge fan base, a digital fan base, an online fan base, and they were interested uh, when I pitched them the idea and they also had total control of, of the song. So they composed the song, they wrote the lyrics. We just had discussions prior to the production. And um, also the, the visual ideas in the video were pretty much the result of our discussions. Yeah, I am as a white male German living in New York at the time, had a, quite a different perspective obviously than they had. And the goal was to merge yeah, an outsider's perspective um, with an insider perspective. And um, for me, the Black Lives Matter movement through uh, the song and the video installation, Blacktivist, of course, was not per se an art piece only designed for galleries and museums. Obviously, the topic is much larger than the institutional space of art. So it was immediately clear that besides the exhibitions, we would release the piece on YouTube on 9-11 at 9, 11 p.m., for example, a very symbolic time. Um, <clears throat> also for the Flatbush Sombers who had this idea because they previously had um, released uh, video, music videos online uh, on that day at that time. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was also an experiment. What can art do for a society? Can we reach a new audience, maybe an audience on the street? Can this song and project be somehow a milestone in the movement? Can it be a document of our time? And unfortunately, I must say that even today, um, when we see the trial beginning um, against the police officer who killed uh, George Floyd, the piece has still the momentum. Blacktivist is ever more up to date, unfortunately, and describes exactly what is happening not only in the US, but also in many parts of the world. This morning, I read the news about a Mexi uh, Mexican police officers who killed a woman uh, through stop and frisk policies by kneeing on her neck. So um, what Blacktivist managed was not only to document and weave in police brutality visually, but it also um, is a testimony of, of um, young Afro-Americans who face this brutality. And uh, music is, of course, a great catalyst to spread a message, maybe even a better medium than art, uh, because we all, there, there are a lot of people who listen to music, and music has different ways of expanding into the world and reaching out and uh, being a memory. And uh, I think we were all astonished that the music video went so viral. From my part, we must also admit that the Flatbush Zombies have most often uh, a huge online crowd. Um, but of course, our music video and the installation is somehow different than a regular music video. It's much more reflective, it's much more aware, it's much more nuanced, um, but it still carries some pop cultural elements. Um, so for me, it was a very fruitful project until today um, because it has opened so many doors and also perspectives and also different feedbacks from newspapers to art magazines, but also to YouTube commentaries. So the engagement from the audience with the piece is, is well documented and it's still growing. So today we have around 3.6 million views. So there's a steady grow um, and there's a steady interest. And if you follow the YouTube comments then you can see how the message is unfortunately preserved every day, uh, which also means that the the project in itself, um, you know, is interestingly very valid. Yeah, often we think about art has also a moment when it when it appears that it reflects that moment of time. But here we have a constant update. Um, I I always think I could re-edit Blacktivist using new types of body cam footage from police officers, yeah, which appear in the beginning of the video um, because it's a repetitive moment. Unfortunately, so 
we see that state authorities haven't really learned much from their mistakes in the past. And I think Blacktivist is a great reminder of that. So in that perspective, the artwork is to a certain extent very successful because it describes what happened about six years ago, uh, but we experienced a very similar notion basically every day. Yes, which is actually dramatic in a sense because it seems that nothing changed actually in a way. And uh, listening to you talking about uh, um, confront yourself to everyday life and situation and uh, you were just said that uh, you are asking yourself, what can we do for our society? So what do you think uh, um, about the artwork? What do you think about digital diffusion of artworks and how do you think museums could face and surpass the physical barriers of institutional venues in order to reach out a wider audience actually as you just did with uh, this project. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm an artist. I'm not uh, working necessarily in a museum uh, all the time, or I'm not a curator, I'm not a director of institution. But what I can say from artistic perspective is that projects that have different lives and different spheres seem very interesting to me. So when I try to produce an artistic project, I, I think, not necessarily only about the museum or gallery space. I also think about how can I bring uh, the project to another audience that doesn't necessarily go into museum? How can I attract an uh, audience outside the museum to go into the museum? Yeah, obviously it's also about what do you show where? Uh, you mentioned the defense distributors, 3D gun milling uh, parts of the video installation. They are more explicitly explained in the exhibition space because they wouldn't necessarily fit into the rhythm of a music video. So it's also about um, maybe having a project and having different aspects in the project that need maybe different spaces. Yeah, so in other installations, um, I would work in between a video installation for a museum space, a TV version, a, a cinema version. Yeah, also trying to acknowledge the different languages in the different spaces. Yeah, so the language on YouTube is a different language than within a museum. And if I would imagine the museum of the uh, future, I think it is about also granting artists the opportunities to work beyond the museum walls. Yeah, um, through commissions, through projects. And I think that there's, there's a lot of progress um, worldwide to think about outside of the box. It's also about where do artists produce? Yeah, if you produce, let's say in an epicenter like New York or Berlin, it's something else than uh, you produce in Lagos. So also the physical barriers, the geographical barriers, I think they should not hinder artists to be visible. So, so that's another aspect that digital art um, has the opportunity to be seen everywhere and anywhere, and it's still valuable. Um, and there shouldn't be a big difference um, whether it's been shown on YouTube or a museum like Mudam, yeah? yeah. In the best case scenario, it's, a, it's somehow a symbiosis and uh, um, a large audience can um, gain from that, but also the institution can gain from it by just simply having new audiences. And I think it's also about the topic. That's why we also chose a music video for that part because it attracts a lot of young people and they understand the music video as, as a piece of art anyways. Yeah, for them it's a cultural production that uh, isn't about low and high culture and pop and elitist culture. Uh, it's simply culture. And I think museums in the past also have not acknowledged the strong intellectual barriers they have built in order to present things in a, in a museum. And I think that keeps also audience away. And then it's also the question, what do you want to negotiate within the museum walls? Do you want to negotiate art history? Do you want to negotiate society, politics, the law? Um, do you want to um, really negotiate very current and very urgent issues? Yeah, so the form of an artistic work plus the audience plus the space, they define also the momentum of the work. Yeah, and we have chosen that path. And for, for Blacktivist, I think that was a very valid and very 
intriguing uh, format because it allowed us to speak to multiple environments because the Black Lives Matter movement has also something to do with the institutional structures of museums. Yeah, we see this with uh, uh, workers' rights, we see it with minimum pay, all these things of institutional racism play into the larger Black Lives Matter movement. And I think therefore Black activists should be you know, visible in many, many facets of our digital world. Yes, and actually what we have tried to do with our Me Family platform is that exactly the point to try to develop in a very wider way uh, the art message and the fact that all of the artists accepted to be part of this project was already a big success. And um, actually the film uh, we have chosen uh, by you for the Me Family me family platform is very different from Blacktivist, is entitled again, is from 2018, has been commissioned by the 10th Berlin Biennale in 2018. It was co-produced by your studio together with the broadcaster Run Funk Berlin Brandenburg in collaboration with Art & Co. You have reconstructed in this film an incident that took place in 2016 near Dresden, your home city and in which after an argument with a supermarket salesperson, an Iraqi refugee, Shabazz Al-Aziz, has been physically attacked by four local residents and later tied up to a tree. While the four men were allowed to return home, unobstructed by the police, Al-Aziz was taken to the police station and then released again after a, an amount of time. But almost a year later, the court case relating to the incident was opened and dismissed after just a few hours as the body of the refugee who should have testified the week before the hearing was found dead in a forest. What is really shocking from the story is that the court very easily dismissed the case because of, they said, lack of public interest and because the man, the refugee, has been always declared as a very sick, aggressive person. While the four men, the court uh, declared, they acted for self-defense. Now, thanks to the support of research done by investigative journalists, you asked about the reasons for the dismissal of the case. And inspired by the amateur video uh, taken in the supermarket, which had immediately gone uh, viral on the internet, you reconstructed the incident using professional actors and invited citizens of different nationalities, all immigrants to Germany, to be the jurors. You recreated the case, installing a proper film uh, stage, letting the professional actors being the narrator in the sense of the story, giving to all of us in this way the possibility to better understand, to um, rethink about the story itself, rising ourselves questions. You have explained in the video the personal story of the refugee and in order to give us more information about him and not just presenting him as a refugee who entered in a supermarket. He was actually suffering of epilepsy and this is the reason why he moved away from Iraq to Germany in order to be treated and hopefully cured. Actually, he was sent when he arrived to a, a neurological clinic uh, in Arnsdorf, and then he went missing in a forest for a very long time. And he, he was always described just as a sick man in danger for his lack of orientation. So after this presentation, you allowed the jurors to present their own judgments on what happened, and you asked them universal questions about justice, identity, solidarity, the right of life, and the influence certain situation have on our perception of reality and manipulation of the news. The jurors who are all immigrants, who have all been welcomed in Germany in a very different way from the Iraqi refugee, their rights has been accepted. They were really, I can say devastated and horrified by the story. And here I would like to quote some of the sentences they uh, declared in the video. Um, 
they said clearly everyone must be protected by the constitution. This is not right, this is just hate. The mistake is by the state here. The state should be treat these people who are coming from war countries in a different way. The total failure is by politician. I lost trust in police and in court. This is not democracy anymore. This is a just sad normality uh, reality. This is expression of poor racism. And the last woman who actually ended the <clears throat> her uh, comment crying, she said that I know what it's like to be treated like an alien. Then you conclude the video with a ending message. Civil courage is not punishable by law. So I, I was also very shocked by the, the video and um, it's difficult actually to watch it uh, more than one time because uh, you're already devastated the first time. But I rewatched it many times in order to better understand the story and also the position of the people you are invite you have invited to be part of the video itself. Um, I would like to ask you first of all why you have entitled the video again, and then I will go on with my other questions. Yeah, again has actually two meanings for me uh, in this project. First of all, we deal with a, a real scenario, a real case a real story of a man who died in the forest and was attacked in a supermarket by four men who acted uh, in their words with civil courage and that had to be proven and there was no real legal case it was dismissed around after four hours the case was opened so i wanted to stage it again i wanted to because i wasn't present in the courtroom i wasn't present in the supermarket i wanted to understand how this case built up how how it um, came alive and so we said, okay, let's do it again. That's the first idea about the title. The other title is that history repeats itself, it seems. So again and again, we have scenarios where people who migrated to Germany or to other European countries are attacked or discriminated, live under fear. We in Germany have a strong history um, in the 1930s where racism ended up in a worldwide disaster. So again, also points out to how do we learn from our own history? Uh, can we break through that devil's cir circle? Can we have it not happening again? Yeah. So again, is also somehow living in a historical loop. Yeah, and it's also, if you look at the video installation, then because it's shown in a loop, you are confronted with the same story over and over again until we as a society would find a way to interrupt that circle. And obviously we haven't found a way. It feels more like that the, the circle is spinning faster. Yeah. If you look at the US with the Trump administration, if you look at uh, Brazil, um, if you look at the rise of right-wing parties across Europe. So again, it's also a reminder that we, you know, we cannot be just sitting back. We need to intervene, yeah? And so, so there's a structural element, there's a, so, a sociological element, there is maybe a technical element to the title, but there's also a human element to the title that again and again, we need to learn a lesson. Yes. And we have to remember that, I think. This is very important. So you have decided to involve people who had a very different experience from yours. The 10 persons you have called to be interviewed are individuals who do not have any relation with the art world and, and not even with the incident itself. How do they react to your call <clears throat> when you invited them to be part of this project? Yeah, first of all, the, the research for Germans who have a, a migrant history um, over about 30, 35 years uh, was quite difficult. I wanted to work within this age group because for me it was very important being raised in the GDR in the eastern part of Germany before the wall came down that we had two Germanys. So um, there were two political and economic systems, capitalism, socialism, democracy, and maybe, yeah, a regime. 
So for me, it was interesting how people migrated to the, to the both Germanys, under which conditions, how they were welcomed, how they were integrated, if at all, and how uh, do they think about that past as well. With the unification, there was also a rise of uh, racism, and um, through the change of the economic structure of the Eastern part, there was even a two-class society between the two Germanys. Yeah, and I wanted to cover these experience as well, talking about racism and discrimination today. So often I was asked, why are all these people like of a certain age, 50 plus? And I said, well, it needs the experience that I don't have. Um, I was eight when the wall came down. I hardly could determine the difference. But people who were 18, 20, 25, who maybe came from Cuba or from Hungary or from the Western Sahara, they uh, lived through these two political systems and the two racist systems very differently. And um, so it wasn't easy to track down um, such citizens. Um, and it took a long time, but it also took a long time to build trust amongst them um, to work with me because it's also something we don't usually see on the media or on TV or on radio that people with a migrant history talk about their reflection of our society today. They are hardly invisible in our media economy. So for me, it was also being an artist and not being a TV reporter or a broadcaster or a moderator for a TV station. It was also about talking about art of sharing something and bringing attention to something maybe in a smaller way, but potentially also in a bigger way if the project would succeed. Uh, because we always had a TV broadcaster Arte as a co-producer on board. Yeah, so it would, would be clear that it eventually the project would be broadcasted on TV, which is the biggest audience you can reach with a film nowadays, uh, besides uh, streaming services. So reaching out, and then over six months, I, I had regular meetings with my jurors who decided to at least listen to me. And uh, we, we met at their homes. I explained uh, what I'm trying to do. I didn't release too much information of what they're going to see. But it was more about, I need your expertise based on your life experience to look at my art project. And I want you to talk about it in relation to your own biography. So usually the longer somebody lives, the more life experience they have. That's not a rule per se, but for most of the people um, having lived through different political, economical, societal systems and moments, they, they just have a wider range of emotions towards that society. And that's what interested me. And that was the value because my experience is limited due to the political economic system I lived through, how I grew up and also the non-experience of racism I've experienced in my life. Yeah, so it's always about working with people, speaking with people that also I can learn from. That's a kind of a premise in all of my projects. I try to work with people that have a different angle than I do, a different life experience, a different way to articulate these emotions and ideas. So once this trust was built, we had limited time because they were present during the full production of the video installation and the film, but then they only had about three minutes to act on camera to give their response. So, and that's when the trust really um, came out, when they trusted me and these big film cameras and a big film set in order to reflect on what they've seen, reflect on the crime that happened to Shabazz Al-Aziz, but also to connect it with their own biography, to say, based on my life experience, I feel that way, yeah? Whether I can analytically look at the life of Shabazz and the failure of our justice system, my jurors always had the emotional component because they might have felt reminded again of what they had experienced while they migrated or fled. Yeah, and I think that is something I wish they would come out with. And in a way, I believe that being part of the project, that's also what they wish to share with the audience. And these are testimonies we don't see on TV usually. Mm. And I think an art project at the space of art can also bring that trust, but it can also be a safe haven. It can also be a bubble that protects its protagonists. Yeah, because as an artist, I'm more interested in that somebody offers their opinion than to judge it. 
that's not up to me. Um, it's not something that I want to pressure somebody to come out with an idea. I want to be the person that moderates and creates an atmosphere of sharing and caring. Yeah, because I believe the only reason why we staged this film was to make these jurors speak so that an, an art audience, a film audience, a TV audience can learn from them. Yeah, because most of the audience that might see this film will, will not be in the position of Shabazz. It will be in the position of somebody like me or of the jurors who live with us. Yeah, so it's really about the strategy of saying, who do we listen to? Who do I put into the frame? And so you have this interesting balance between the jurors and the famous TV actors that serve as moderators. You have Shabazz. So it's, it's a mixture of, of people that are either involved, look at the case, or emotionally attach themselves to the case and build empathy for all of us. Yes. As, um, as you're explaining at a certain moment in the video itself, and you also have explained in a conversation, in a very interesting conversation you had with Stan Douglas, if you or any other German citizen could have been missed for more than just one day, the police would have started to search for you or for the missing person immediately. Um, while in the case of the refugee who was missed for a very long time, if I'm not wrong, 28 days, no one looked for him. Also, actually, um, there is a testimony of, the, of a conversation in the video between the brother of Al-Aziz and a friend of him. And his brother is saying that uh, he considered German, Germany as a developed country where things like these shouldn't happen. He uh, mm, defined Germany uh, a country of law and order. So this declaration opened up an identity issue also about German identity. Um, again, as you have mentioned in, in this conversation with uh, Stan Douglas, Germans suffered not to have experienced a national identity in public since World War II, as you were just saying also before. How do you think, Mario, has changed today the value of national identity in Germany and how the German people react in front of the war, world refugees crisis and drama? Yeah, I think in Germany, we have, like in many other European countries, a very mixed uh, perception of um, who we are as Germans. And um, again, I must say, um, we need to always refer to history in order to assess certain shifts, uh, global shifts, uh, like the refugee crisis, like big migration movements. And we, we easily can determine the reasons why people migrate, because their life is at risk. There is war, there are social inequalities, there are maybe religious inequalities and discrimination, and that makes people move. I would say there are only a few people in the world who would love to leave their house. But also, I must always, when I, when I discuss these topics, point out to my own um, situation that how can I judge the decision to migrate if I have never experienced war, terror, racism, discrimination. Honestly, for me, it's very hard to judge. So I will not judge. That's also why I invited the jurors because I feel they are in a much stronger position to judge what they saw and to, to discuss what happened to Shabazz al -Aziz. So it's also the position from where we stand and discuss. I will not comment or judge somebody's decision to migrate to Germany for a better life. Uh, my position is to say, welcome. Our wealth is built on other countries' difficult situations. Yeah, we extract um, labor resources from other countries to build our wealth. So it's our immediate uh, responsibility to help and to assist and to be open. Otherwise, our wealth would not exist. So obviously, um, there is a growing number of German citizens who believe they need to protect the wealth that they have built on other countries and nations and uh, uh, continents uh, resources. So that's again, uh, also a historical parallel to the 1930s that 
in order to protect our cultural uh, identity, which is always something that is uh, developing, changing, growing, yeah, becoming more complex, becoming more diverse. It has always been that way. But of course, there are nationalist ideas to define what is the German identity. And I think most of them um, are populist, and that's why also why they are to a certain extent successful. But um, they are also false. Yeah, as many scholars could explain in, in a better way than I do. Um, but somehow, how do we deal with that? Because that's not easily going away by describing these are these are false arguments. These uh, these are historically sociologically wrong arguments. They still exist and they gain power, as we can see in elections. And what we also see with the Corona crisis is that we have nationalist way, for example, for the vaccine production and the vaccine distribution. That is, I think, also another very scary aspect that um, societies and especially capitalist societies, of course, always think short term in, in a way to, to gain profit and to be stable and to protect markets and to protect wealth and living standards, yeah, without acknowledging that there will always be a weaker um, country next door, probably. Yeah, so this race against who gets the vaccine first and who is exporting to which country and who is not exporting, I think that's uh, maybe a more real uh, and current uh, feeling of um, the creation of national identities based on misery of a crisis. Yeah, and with the refugee crisis, it was it was never really an economic issue for Germany. I would even say there's a great resource of, of labor coming to the country. That's how a lot of conservative um, politicians also argued in order to shift um, somehow the focus um, when just 1.5 million people arrived in Germany. Let, let it be 2 million. That's somehow a manageable number in my point of view. And I think our welfare system can manage that and our wealth can manage that. And beyond that, there are ethical and moral uh, responsibilities that we just have as a central European country. Um, so it's a very tough question and each crisis uh, puts oil into the fire. Um, so it's something I deal with in my work a lot with these um, ideas about yeah, discrimination, cultural and national identities. And it's really, really not easy. So I do read a lot of sociological studies and, and books and uh, reports and uh, case studies. And it's, it's very hard for scientists, for conflict researchers, for sociologists to really define uh, the political momentum with the emo emotional state of, of people, of citizens. Yeah, and the Germany is so it's uh, quite complex because we do have these uh, two German states in the past, and we two, we have two parallel emotions governing um, our national and cultural identity in Germany up until today. Not necessarily so much in my generation, but uh, about older generations, but also in my generation, people will somehow start to believe that the East German identity is a different one than the West German identity. Whether I will belong to a potentially group of citizens who would say, well, I'm a European. Mm. Yeah? And that comes also with a burden. European is not necessarily a positive yeah. uh, aspect of, of my uh, cultural and national identity. Um, so I made a project in, in 2016 called about education and fear. It's a nine hour interview project with people from the right wing protest movement in East Germany, but also with conflict researchers, um, therapists, soci sociologists. And uh, that was quite eye opening how much the, your own biography, the way you grew up, what your parents and your school taught you, how they influence your political behavior and thinking, besides the media. Yeah, but it's a symbiosis again. Where do you come from? Um, how do you define your cultural identity? But also, how do you define a prospective country, for example? Mm -hmm. What's a good country? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people answer this question when I ask them, oh, I want it to be like 20 years ago. If you would have asked them 20 years ago, they would have probably said, I want it to be like 20 years mm -hmm. ago, like 40 years ago. So it's a, it is an emotional topic, yeah? And it's about 
delusion in a way. And it's not about necessarily about optimism, because if I uh, want to think about a prosperous country, I must project into the future, not into the past. Yeah. Yeah. And if you do not have this optimism that based on the learning of the past of our history, you can project into a brighter future, then I guess you have a problem as a yeah. nation if you are backwards turned. And we have seen it in the US, what, it, what damage that the election of Trump has created and how difficult it will be to reverse that. Yeah, so it's a very tough societal um, challenge and the pandemic will not necessarily help. I, I would have believed maybe in the early months of the pandemic that there must be a strong global movement of solidarity. And maybe that was uh, existing for a few weeks and months, but the longer the Western world was not able to function in their progressive profit making way of life and way of making business, the more tired people became. And the more they saw their life standard flush away while other regions that would, would never have this life standard. So people would complain about their isolation, their limitations, their um, non-freedom. Mm -hmm. You would say, well, it's for a certain time and it will potentially not define all your life, but there are other areas in the world, Palestine, Yemen, um, Myanmar, where you will probably never have the freedom that we have, yeah? And I think these are, again, reminders to each citizen, how do we live and uh, how, how is the world governed? And how do I want to be part of that? And uh, also, how do I want to engage with that? So I think for me, there's more to learn from a pandemic than to miss. Yes. Yeah, and um, I think through an even greater effort of solidarity, there would have been less people killed. And there would have been an interesting rebalance of how is this world functioning. Uh, instead, we see that a lot of countries that are not in the economic epicenters do not get vaccines or get vaccines that are not working. Um, and so I think the, the shift between, yeah, or the gaps they, uh, between continents, the gaps between countries uh, eventually will rise. And uh, I think that's a huge mischance and it will be oil into the fire of populists. Yes, I, I really liked your comment about the pandemic, the fact that you can learn instead of missing. And I agree because we gain time at the end in this long year where we finally had, I believe, in my opinion, more time to read, to think, to learn, and to try to uh, put yourself also, I think, in another approach in front of society. And actually speaking about society of today, of nowadays, we can, um, I have my last question actually for you that is about our generation. We live in an area that is dominated by social media, by new medias, by amplification of the news. And most of the time, these news that are surrounding us are always negative news. So um, it's not easy to compare in this kind of society uh, and to discern what is real from what is fake, what you read from what you really see and you experience. What do you think is the role of the art in relation to a world dominated by social media, by internet, and by this uh, immense dissemination of the news? Yeah, I think the power of art, at least for me, is that we define um, our information and the way we distribute this information pretty much independent in a way. And uh, we don't have um, the necess necessity to be fast and quick and bold. That's one strategy, of course. But we can also take time and we can reflect and we can also have a very little voice and still be heard to a certain extent. I think that's a power that as an individual artist, 
you can basically work for yourself and see what happens. And you can do that over a long period of time, as many artists have proven who didn't uh, gain fame or uh, never made um, somehow an existential minimum uh, to live from. So art is, first of all, an expression of thoughts that has a great power to be very individual and very independent. And because we honestly don't really need a newspaper to print what we do. We don't need a broadcaster to show what we do. We don't need a publisher to print the book. It's of course wonderful if it happens, but nevertheless, that's not really my premise. And I think many artists would really somehow fight and, and um, protect this kind of liberty to be independent, yeah? And I think that makes you diametral different than any social media and also journalism because, you know, here and there we see that, that great investigative journalism is, is respected, respected, um, but um, the business is dominated by news that are scandalous and that are fast and that are bold. So, of course, we can all, we also have these moments in, in art. We have artists who, who are bold and fast and loud, but um, art history has, has also taught us that it's about the smaller voices and that there's always a space for an artist to become visible at some moment in history. And I think that whole idea that we think about art in a very long time, forward and backward, makes it something very unique. We can read a book that is 200 years old and we feel like it was written yesterday. Um, it's valid uh, today. Yeah. Um, think about how few news and journalistic achievements are reshown, redistributed. There are a few, maybe the Watergate uh, <laughs> crisis <laughs> or investigation. Yeah, so art and the institutions that protect art and collect art um, somehow also give credit to this labor, yeah, of this cultural labor um, over a long period of time. And I think the slowness of that system um, is, is a huge benefit for a society. Um, it's also, one must say, a very intellectual and critical environment. So it's art production and uh, the art critique, art history. These are quite intellectual disciplines. So there is also a great chance that um, art, you know, gains attention or is discussed amongst people who take it very serious and who also have a responsibility to society and to readers, other scientists, yeah? So with the news economy, it's about how many viewers you get. So it's a completely different approach. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there might be a few artists who take this as the first premise, how many people can I reach? To which price, but uh, potentially uh, we have different goals and aims, and it's it's quite also difficult to to make art, yeah, because there are so many things to to reflect on and to think about. So one can only hope, as a uh, practicing artist, that art is more put into the center of society. I think the pandemic has shown how important culture is, and how yeah empty lives feel without culture. I think that's another learning from the pandemic. Um, nevertheless, we still live and work in most of us in uh, political and economic systems that somehow carry the right of the stronger yeah, at the core. And so art is always strong, yeah, but uh, <laughs> it's not necessarily always put into the center place. Yeah, in the long term, yes. Um, if you look at the Louvre and institutions like this, Everybody loves them, but um, it's also the question, how can we integrate art into more pockets, into everyday life? How is this more accessible? And it feels like that only if you miss something, you start to pay attention. Yeah. And however, I also believe that um, making art is a certain way of, of activism as well. It's uh, because you have to find your own way, you have to find your own standpoint, you have to find a topic to deal with from your point of view. Um, art is not really a tool to uh, make a statement to attract masses. It might be in some aspects, 
but uh, it's much more than that. And I think that's differentiates it from, yeah, the news business, the entertainment business. Um, there's also entertainment and can be critical and challenging that we come back to uh, now and then. Um, but overall, I think art has the power to be quite analytical, but also be emotional, be aesthetic, be political, um, be ethical and moral uh, in order to challenge audiences in a way from one individual to another, which is also interesting. Most of the social media, TV uh, news, uh, uh, big Hollywood entertainment, it's always created by a huge group of people in order to bring it to a huge market. So if you don't have a market per se as an artist, then uh, you have to think about what you're gonna put out. So it comes back to you. Mm. You can eventually hope that there will be an audience and maybe a market, but um, that's probably the only way to be meaningful within the context of art. But that meaningfulness can actually last for a long time because I don't really remember a, a movie I saw in, in the cinema four years ago because the perception of that cultural medium is okay, there's another film next door. There will be another one next week. Yeah, so it must be an outstanding uh, movie that I will remember it. Yeah, and I think with art, of course, we also look at the things that are that are visible, but we also have books as containers. So sometimes we overlook things, but they are somehow documented here and there. So again, the slowness of the art system is a huge benefit mm -hmm. for for a total society that should also be constructed of social media and movies and TV. I have no issues with mm -hmm. me, uh, uh, media, but we should also understand the power of them, but also the weakness and vice versa, the power of art, but also maybe it's weakness that you need to invest something to find it, to deal with it. Yeah, Art needs attention in a very, very different way. It's nothing to lean back. It's nothing that comes to your home, at least, not until today, uh, in most cases, you need to make an effort. And I think each society needs that effort. Yeah, and I mean, let's be honest, the, the oldest um, cultural artifacts are artworks. Yes. And there's a reason for that. And um, that's the real power. So if there is a crisis, let's say a war, what is being protected first? It's the artwork. It's the un- um, reproducible artwork like a painting or a sculpture that cannot be recreated because it was already created yeah so that's something I find we should never forget yes I mean you are right and the power of art we can say we hope so is going to be eternal forever so this is extremely important for all of us and i believe that you are right during the pandemic we probably all rethink about the power of art and the importance of the role of art as a communication tool to all of us so uh, mario i thank you very much unfortunately we are running out of time i want to just make a brief conclusion about this amazing conversation just uh, underlining uh, uh, what i really find myself interesting in your work is the way you are immersing yourself in the story in the topic you are analyzing the fact that you want to always dive deep in this uh, subject, being in contact for a, a very long period of time with the persons you are involving in the project, in the story that you have chosen to analyze in order to be able to unfold, uh, I would say the secret value and the meaning of the story itself. So I would like to invite the public who is listening to us to discover this analytical approach uh, that you have watching your video again, but also your other um, works that actually are, um, that people can also see on your website. And I really invite the public to raise questions about the perception of reality, the role of ourselves as responsible and active citizens, trying to be uh, neutral and impartial in front of society and not too much 
instead manipulated by the power of the news, by the social media. So thank you again, Mario. <laughs> and uh, I hope to talk to you very soon again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mario. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.